Welcome to the show discussing problems and issues of health with Dr. Alcena. For this segment of the show, I'm going to continue to talk about hypertension and update. Last week, I gave you an overview of the crisis that exists in the field of hypertension as we speak. And I will give you another overview of it in this show as well to continue that process. Hypertension is one of the leading diseases across the world. There's 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. 1.5 billion have hypertension. In this country, 103 million people suffer from essential hypertension. Across the world, one out of every four adult men suffer from hypertension. One out of every five adult women suffer from hypertension. And in this country, of all the 103 million people who have hypertension, you have to understand that one out of every three adults, American in this country, have hypertension. And in the black community, it's one of every two adults suffer from hypertension, meaning that hypertension is the number one disease literally in this country. And yet, it is the least properly treated, least well-treated disease of all the diseases that we have to deal with in this country. And you say, well, how so? Well, I'll get into that. To make matters worse, there's a list of medication called AB, angiotensin receptor blocker 2. They are just fantastic. They're the best medication out there, frankly, to treat hypertension and that they protect the kidney from a condition called microalbumin, that is little tiny albumin that get into the tubules of the kidney and damages them. That's one, of, that's one of the ways that the kidney can fail. And often, of course, there's, well, ab protects from that. In addition to that, when somebody develops congestive heart failure, the abs, via interesting mechanism, help to treat the congestive heart failure itself in addition to treating the blood pressure that may have caused the hypertension. Those are very, very important medication. But what happened to them? Well, last year, in the, begin in the end of last year, the beginning of this year, the FDA came out with a statement, recommendation that these medications are no longer to be used because the factories that made them, one factory in India and one factory in China, contaminated this medication with a substance that, is, that can cause cancer. Because of that, all the abs were recalled. That is catastrophic. And yet, no other company has set foot, has set forward to want to start making them again. So right now, so we don't have those medications to use them. All the insurance companies have sent out a list and a, they notice not to use them. The FDA said not to use them and everybody's standing right there. So that really, there are other medications that are used for hypertension, and I'll tell you about them, but the abs were just fantastic. You could have combined them with hydrochlorothiazide, as they often did, and you could have used them by themselves to treat other conditions, such as congestive heart failure. We don't have them. So now we're left with calcium channel blockers, which are very good. We're left with ACE inhibitors, which are very good in some ethnic groups. And of course, we're left with the uh, alpha blockers, the adrenalines of the world, clonidine, those kind of things. Clonidine is super good, but they make you sleepy. So you have to take it only at night. Then of course, we have hydrochlorothiazide type medication. What has to be understood is the fact that the mechanism, why one develops essential hypertension to begin with, as I got into last week. There are two types of hypertension. Essential hypertension, which is 90%, 97% of all hypertension. And then you have hypertension that can be caused by pheochromocytoma, which is adrenaline, which is a epinephrine type secreting tumor that can cause hypertension via a different mechanism and or you could have what's called renovascular hypertension, namely when the arteries that are carrying blood to the kidneys get obstructed with some damage to the arteries, 
that cause renovascular hypertension. That account for three percent. If you come with cytoma and the renovascular hypertension, it counts for three percent of all hypertension. Okay? And of course those are treated differently. That's the key. So of the ninety seven percent of hypertension, now comes the problem. All ethnic groups, no matter what you think of yourself, everybody who has functioning kidneys ought to be given a thiazide type diuretic as the first step. Hypertension is to be treated as a step ladder effort concept. First you start with a water pill, and if the water pill is not sufficient, then you add a second or a third medication. That's where the ethnicity comes in. That's where the problem is. Because of that, the, la the lack of understanding and or the reluctance to discuss these things with patients. Believe me, I'm a practicing physician. I've been at this 47 years, and I've taught generation of doctors how to practice medicine the best way. I know what's going on. I know this stuff bit better than I know the palm of my hand. I can understand what my colleagues are going through. I'm not making excuses for them, but I can tell you it is very difficult to sit in an examining room and telling a patient who asks you, why cannot I use this medication? And you have to come up to the true answer to say, well, you can't use an ACE inhibitor because you are not Caucasian. That's a very difficult word to say, but it is the reality. But it's very uncomfortable for people to hear that because we are living in the United States of America, the greatest country on earth, no question about it. But it has this basic problem in its DNA that is racial discrimination. And people like myself, who's a Negro, I have to deal with this 24-7. Every single thing I do every day, I have to literally choreograph how I sneeze when I walk out of the door to go to the hospital. I literally have to choreograph how I cough when I leave my door to walk half a block to go to White Plain Hospital. Because that little walk from my door to the door of the hospital is sufficient to get me into major trouble. And then while I'm in the hospital, I have to tiptoe, like uh, that beautiful song, tiptoe on the tulips, so that I'm, I'm, I'm smiling, I'm very polite, I'm doing my work professionally, but I'm constantly, constantly conscious of the fact that, Val, be careful what you say, be careful who you talk to, be careful how you do this, because this is ridiculous. This is what I have to deal with in order to survive, in order to stay alive, to practice so I can take care of my patient. And it is ridiculous, but that's what I have to do. And if you drop your guard for one second, that's the millisecond that gets you into trouble. Because it is real. This is not paranoia. This is the fact that people of color have to deal with 24-7. And I am one of the most successful <laughs> physicians, one of the most successful persons in the United States of America. This is what I have to deal with. Can you imagine the other folks who are not in the position that I am, what they're going through? For me, at my level, I'm a leading physician in the 21st century in this country, I'm a leading physician in the world, I have to deal with this 24, and I better deal with it. If I don't, I'm in trouble, okay? So therefore, it is very difficult to sit in the examining room and to tell the patient, I cannot give you an ACE inhibitor, and they say, but Dr. Alcina, why? I say, because you are not Caucasian. They say, but could you explain? Sure, I can explain to you, because all Caucasian individual across the world have normal renin level. And the ACE inhibitor must bring down the renin level in order to bring the blood pressure down. That's how angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor works. That's the mechanism. So if you don't have sufficient renin, where is the renin going to be for it to work on to bring the pressure down? So therefore, that's the reality. 
And if you are a non-Caucasian person, no matter what you are, what you think of yourself, you have every right to feel the way you do, to think what you think. That's your human right. That's your whatever right you want to call it. But in medical sense, physiologically, I don't have the, 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 the how can I professionally sit here and tell you something differently when I know it's not true? I cannot do that. I took an oath to tell the truth, to do what is right. So therefore, I must tell you, sir or ma'am, you cannot get this medication. Yes, it is good for blood pressure, but it's not good for blood pressure for you. The only time a non-Caucasian person could use an ACE inhibitor, it's contraindicated. When is that time? When the kidney is partially failed, is failing because at that time the renin level goes up, at which point the ACE inhibitor is contraindicated. Why? Because it's going to cause the serum potassium to go up. So therefore you cannot use it. Even though the renin is high in this setting, but the kidney is failing. At which point this ACE inhibitor makes the potassium goes up. So therefore it is contraindicated. And yet, ACE inhibitor is plentiful. There's nothing wrong with them. They're excellent medication in the right setting in the right person. Okay? And of course, the powers to be who are paying for these things, they're flooding the market with ACE inhibitor because they're cheaper. I received the list. All of us received the list from the different unions, from the different insurance companies for the thing that they cover. The, long of, the list is quite long of all of them, ACE inhibitor, and, they, and then there's, these companies are loaded with non-Caucasian people that are working for them and then taking the money from the paycheck so they can provide medication for them. And yet the medication they're providing for them is absolutely, completely, totally not good for them. I recall three years or so ago, I was so angry, I actually wrote a letter, something I am not good with the computer. I wrote, I tick tack 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 on the computer. I wrote this patient I have letter to this company to tell them, to explain the mechanism of ACE inhibitor to them, that my patients, they were treating, that live in Yonkers, was, I was not going to go along with that. These people got that letter. I never get a response. For medical legal reasons, they never send me a response. But they send the patient, okay? They changed the medication for the patient. I knew nothing about it until a month ago, a month later, I haven't heard from the patient. So I called to find out what is going on, sir, because I want the patient to get the water. They're arguing with me over thiazide medication. For 30 pills, was $7. They're getting into a big fight with me. They want the patient to have the ACE inhibitor, but not the thiazide, because this ACE inhibitor costs cheaper than the $7 per month. You can't make this up. So I wanted to know what happened to the patient. So I called the, the gentleman. I said, well, what's going on? I haven't heard from him. He said, oh, I heard from them. I heard from them. They changed the medication. They never respond to me. They get in touch with the patient. They send the patient the medication I was fighting for without contacting me. So I don't know what's going on with this guy. So I call him for what's going on. Because I, I know why they didn't respond, because there's no way they can justify doing what they were doing legally, so they don't want to put in any writing. You can't make this up, okay? I mean, I was so frustrated. Two o'clock in the morning, I'm click clacking down in the office in the computer <laughs> to try to write this letter that I, I know how to write, but I don't know how to do the computer very well. So I had to write this thing three, four times to make sure that everything was correct. Then I made it. I never got a response, but they responded to the patient, okay? So to this day, as far as they're concerned, they never received the letter, but the patient got the medication, okay? You can't make this up. And every single thing that I'm telling you, you can't be a physician. That went to medical school in the modern time, went into training in the modern time, don't know this stuff. They do, but their hands are tied. The fight you gotta get into 
with the insurance companies every day. But that does not justify giving somebody a medication that's not going to work for them. That's the problem. It is not going to work for them. Now, you have to understand, 54% of the people who are hypertensive in this country have the overall group have the, have the blood pressure control. Those are the people who are actually going to the doctors, 54%. So what happened to the other 45%? The pressure is not being controlled. And it is worse in the minority community because, first of all, most of them don't go to doctors. The women do so more than the men. And when they do, they just don't question the doctor. You do what the doctor tells you to do. And then they, that's why you have such a high incidence. The subgroup with the high incidence of congestive heart failure without a heart attack in this country is black men. Okay? Negro slash black men. Because why? Because when the pressure is high, the heart is a muscle. Like when you go to the gym, you're doing the dumbbell work, the heart is pumping against the resistance. The resistance is the elevated pressure. And eventually, the muscle gets stretched to the finite stretchability. The heart becomes enlarged, and it fails because you can only stretch the muscle, the muscle but so much. That's just, you take a little elastic thing, you pull it, it's going to pop. Can't go anymore. That's what happened. That's why when they, they, they have more congestive heart failure than it because not only that they're overweight, I'm going to get into it in, in a minute, but that's what's going on. The subgroup between the 30 and 35 year old, 45 year old African American men, one of the problems that with the heart is not a heart attack. Yes, heart attack can cause congestive heart failure, but it's because of cardiomyopathy, secondary to elevated, untreated blood pressure. And that's it. So therefore then, it's a crisis because I can understand how uncomfortable it is. I, I have students in the office, even if I didn't have students. When the patient asks questions, I have to explain everything in the greatest detail to them. Not only that so that a student can understand it, but the patient can understand in language in which the patient clearly understands, okay? It takes time, but you cannot justify, you cannot defend it any way, shape, or manner, prescribing a medication for someone that you know is not appropriate for him or her. You cannot do it ethically. You cannot do it professionally, but unfortunately, it is being done. And partly because, frankly, doctors don't want to get into trouble with patients. The last thing you want is to get a patient mad at you. You don't want that. Oh, my God. And it takes one case to get you into trouble. So these people don't want the water pill, because the water pill makes them run to the bathroom too often. So they don't take it. Let's give you an example. Let's say for the sake of argument, a doctor or a nurse practitioner or whatever, a PA wanted to give you a prescription for, let's say, a calcium channel blocker, which is an excellent medication, work via different mechanism. And the mechanism I'll explain to you right now. I will eventually talk about medication. You don't have to worry about that. I'll just give you an example. You can't, con I cannot do this without calcium allowing me to do that. I can't contract the muscle. Well, you have s smooth muscle in the wall of your vessel, okay? and they're contracting, the pressure goes up. The calcium channel blocker blocks the f action of calcium that relaxes the smooth muscle, causing the pressure to go down, okay? Fantastic medication. So let's say I were to treat somebody just with calcium channel blocker, which is fantastic medication, to bring the medication, to bring the pressure down. Okay, that can happen, transiently, especially if the dose is high. What do you think the kidney is going to do? The kidney is a very, very smart organ. As soon as the kidney senses that the blood pressure is coming down, there's a substance in the kidney, kidney called aldosterone. Aldosterone is a master salt controller. As soon as the kidney senses that the blood pressure is coming down, 
by using something other than a water pill. Aldosterone is going to come into action, becomes activated, cause the sodium level to go up and the fluid level to go up accordingly, expand the intravascular ses uh, pressure, I mean system, pressure goes right back up. Okay? There you have it. You could do it transiently, but a kidney is very smart because of all the multiple function that the kidneys have to do in our body to keep us healthy, one of them is to control salt, which brings me to the concept of diet. The average black folks in this country, I'm using that as an example, it's seven grams of salt per day, okay? Because diet is a cultural thing. People eat that which they accustomed to, or people eat that which they can afford. And the Negro such, and I'm using the use Negro on purpose. I am a Negro, and I'm a proud to be a Negro. You could call whatever you want for social reason, but you are in reality physiologically a Negro, okay? No matter what you think of yourself. And I have the right to say so because I know physiology. The social political issue, that's your business. I'm not a politician, I'm not a sociologist. I'm a physician and somebody who practices and teaches physiology. So, because the Negro physiology is 100% different than the Caucasian physiology. And they are millions. Let me give you an example of the population distribution so you have an idea. 7.7 7 billion people in the world. Four billion plus, as we speak, live in Asia. 1.6 billion there about live in Africa. Okay, that 5.6 billion right there. You, you, you're getting the point? Okay, all right? And I have not talked about Europe. I haven't talked about North America. And we already 5 point something billion. Okay, you get the idea? So I say this to that there are more non-Caucasian individual in the world than they are Caucasian. That's the reality of it. That's the reality. I have nothing over in Caucasian. My grandfather was, my, great, my grandmother was, and I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you were it not for the help that I received from Caucasian folk that helped me to get into this country, that helped me to get where I am today. The lady who got me started in the field of medicine, she was Caucasian. I showed up at her school because I saw a, an advertisement in the New York Post in the early 60s. I was struggling in the factory. So I showed up near Columbus Circle in that school, Technici Medi medical, Technici medical Assistant School, that was the name of it. I walked in there as broke as you can be. I barely could afford the token to get there. So. I was showed up, as soon as you come by, you say hello, they give you an application, they give you a, a test. Before you even sit down, they give you a pile of paper and a pencil. So I went there. So I did the test. I got all the questions right. And I turn in the paper. The lady say, where's the money? I said, what money? She said, you need $100. That's the admission fee. I said, $100? My God, I don't have $100. So, so I went to a place in Manhattan near Macy's, near that torn no place there. I won't name the name of the outfit, but you know what I'm talking about. The guy asked me for my payment stub. It was $27.50 per week that I take home. The guy says, sir, I cannot lend you $100 because I'll get fired, and frankly, you're not worth $100. So I walk out. I went back to the school and tell this lady this story. She said, what? You know what, sir? I'm going to let you in because you're a brilliant young man, I, I, I have to give you a break. This other guy who was this light-skinned guy from Panama that was running the school for her, said no. So she grabbed him by the hand, they went out to the back. I heard them arguing, and I heard her use the word, I F on the school, damn it, he's coming. I have to give him a break. She came in, she said, sir, you could come in on Monday. Here's the starting time. You pay me when you graduate. Just like that. She was Caucasian. That's how I'm here sitting talking to you about medicine. She took me in. 
Okay, she took me in, I had no money, and sure enough, when I graduated, she sent me to Willowbrook Hospital in Staten Island. Those people over there kept me on a Friday, the whole day, I had my green card. Whole day until 4.30 in the afternoon. They didn't know what to do with me. Then they said, well, we can't hire you because you're not a citizen, even though you have your green card, blah, 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 blah. So I got the idea. You're a Negro, we don't want you here, bye-bye. So by the time I got to the school, it was after 5 o'clock, the school closed. So I came back Monday morning because I was working at night in the factory. Then she gave me another list of hospitals. She sent me to Wyckoff Hospital. And some other day, I'll tell you the rest of the story. That's how I get started, okay? And thanks to New York City, they decided everybody should have a license. And every Saturday, I walked in without staging. I took a license. I was sharing a patient. I got seven licenses, as I'm speaking to you, to work in seven different branches of the laboratory as a medical technology slash supervisor. Okay. That's how I got here. So suffice it to say, it is the reality. So therefore, then, diet plays a major role because diet is ethnic associated. If you are a Negro hub in this country, you go back to soul food that started during slavery, you're accustomed to it. I don't care how wealthy you become, you still crave for that food. On the other hand, if you work in two, three jobs like I used to, you're feasting on fast food. You're going to into and to every poor community, you have little stores all over the place sending fast food. Fast food. Because that's all these people can eat. Some of these people never have a chance to sit down on a Sunday to eat a regular meal. They just grab something for breakfast, grab something for lunch. When they finish, they go into the second job, they grab something else, and they and drink the soda, all that stuff, and they get obese. This thing is full of salt and they develop hypertension. They have a gene already in the kidneys. They're guaranteed to become hypertensive. All you have to be to become hypertensive is be a Negro person and live long enough, you can become hypertensive. That's it, case closed, okay? So therefore, the obesity situation in the minority community is, 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 is in a crisis, has been. I did a series, I think, last year on that. So obesity is highly associated with hypertension. Diet, cause, poor diet causes obesity. Obesity plays a major role in development hypertension. And it is, it goes around and around and around like that. You have to face that reality. I'll be talking about how you treat hypertension eventually, but I'm not ready to do so yet. Until I see you again, this is Dr. Alcina saying so long and bye-bye.